Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you're ready. Uh, we're going to swiftly move through just tons of millions of years here at a time, um, the rise of primates. So 65 million years it took us to get here. Um, and it all started with the catastrophic event in the Cretaceous period. Um, the Cretaceous period runs 106, 135 to about 66 million years ago. Please note that on your quizzes and exams on this material, I am never going to, you know, trick you or ask you about the dates um, associated with these periods. What I will want you to be familiar with are the major events associated with the periods. So um, note that MYA, by the way, moving forward means millions of years ago. So the Cretaceous period is the age of the dinosaurs. Um, and you can see from uh, this image, this is what geologists believe the earth looked like um, around this time. Um, the continents are moving towards their contemporary positions. There's a relatively uniform, damp, um, mild, tropical-like environment, lots of volcanic activity, and you can see that in the warmth. Um, this lighter blue is going to be the warmth of the water. Now, the Cretaceous period has an extinction event that leads to at least 50% loss of life on Earth. But it's also a period of time when insect and flowering plants are starting to appear um, gradually. Now, the big extinction event, remember back to our discussion of natural selection um, and the theory of catastrophism. So catastrophism is um, the, uh, a theory based on the idea that catastrophic events then cause evolution to occur. And it's very true because oftentimes catastrophic events can cause a catastrophic change to an environment. And that's exactly what happened towards the end of the Cretaceous period. We believe about 75 million years ago, there was an impact, an asteroid impact in the Yucatan Peninsula, which is now, you know, essentially, um, Cancun, Mexico. Um, and this is kind of an aerial image, essentially, of what that impact crater looks like. You can see, of course, in the center here that the asteroid hits and then everything radiates out. So these are going to be um, masses of land that have radiated out. This is going to be an enormously catastrophic event in, in many ways. First of all, obviously everything within many, many, many miles is just simply gonna be burned alive um, by the catastrophic event and the fires that are going to lash out. You're gonna have tsunamis as this is going to go out into the ocean and push that out as well also catastrophic. Um, you're going to have rapid volcanic activity. You're going to have a lot of dust up in the air. And that dust is going to be crucial because it is going to prevent the sun from and UV radiation from entering as effectively into the atmosphere. And so we're going to go from kind of a humid, um, damp-like environment in the Cretaceous to uh, a, a kind of cooling trend that is going to allow for certain types of um, environments that don't really exist yet, particularly environments that primates will ultimately inhabit, um, to suddenly appear and proliferate. So huge um, extinction event during this time, wiped out all of the dinosaurs um, and left um, a whole lot of freedom for underground rodent-like mammals to now shift to the Earth's surface. That is going to happen during the Paleocene. So the Paleocene begins about 65 million years ago. You'll notice that the climate has cooled quite a bit just from the um, loss of our kind of lighter blue shade here on this geological image. Um, the Paleocene begins relatively cool, but it does get much warmer towards the end. We're gonna have some shifts in climate here. During this time of the Paleocene, there are going to be three major things that are going to be conducive to the eventual, eventual appearance of primates uh, in another epoch. Those are dense forests of ferns and deciduous trees. Deciduous trees are trees that lose their leaves, very different from tropical versions of those trees. Um, and deciduous trees tend to grow in cooler environments. So massive dense forests are going to start to appear during the Paleocene, as well as fruiting plants, which are called angiosperms. These are going to proliferate enormously during this time, um, which is also going to allow insects to proliferate. So, so bear with me here, right? No primates yet, but we truly are paving the way 
We have uh, dense habitat that primates will ultimately um, adapt to. And we have uh, three food resources, all the resources, leaves, fruits, and um, insects, all proliferating enormously during this time, really paving the way for primate-like traits to start appearing. Now, no primates um, are known to have existed during this time, but we do think that the ancestor to all living primates would likely have been existing during this time. Um, and the consensus among paleoanthropologists is that primates evolved from a group of uh, rodent-like insectivores or squirrel-like insectivores that existed during the Paleocene called plesiatopiforms. Plesiatopiforms. And one example of plesiatopiforms that may be a contender um, is Purgatorius ceratops of North America. So this is an image of what we believe Purgatorius ceratops looked like, um, you know, very rodent-like, right? But Purgatorius ceratops and plesiatopiforms in general definitely have some changes comparatively to other mammals, uh, placental mammals at the time. So they have more generalized teeth structure, which is what we're, and heterodonty, which is what we're going to see in primates. Then they have ankle bones that reflect a much wider range of motion and grasping ability. This is not seen among other rodent-like animals during this time, only among plesiatopiforms, which is why we believe, right, grasping is going to be a very important part of primate life, that plesiatopiforms, or purgatory ceratops in particular, may in fact be an ancestor that evolved ultimately into all primates. The Eocene is the first era of true primates, right? About 55 million years ago, um, it's during this epoch that we see definitive primates. Um, and so at the end of the Paleocene is a warming period, which of course means that the Eocene um, starts very warm. Um, and what we're going to see climactically during the Eocene is basically woodlands everywhere. I don't know why I get the hiccups when I do this, but I do. So thank you for your patience. Um, during the Eocene, we're talking about a fully woodlanded environment, top to bottom, almost no climactic diversity. Um, everywhere is covered in trees, right? Everywhere is covered in dense deciduous trees that are rapidly replacing tropical versions. Of course, tropical versions still exist, but we are setting the stage for all of those traits that primates will use to live arboreally, right, in the trees. Um, during the Eocene. So these are some of the traits we see appearing um, during the Eocene among uh, the first true primates. And those are smaller snouts with larger eyes. Um, that means nocturnal primates, right? So we're going to start losing that, that snout. Um, here is the first time we see the post-orbital bar. Remember that this is a distinctive primate trait, and that is the bone that fully encircles and encases the eye orbit, right, fully encircles it. This appears first in the Eocene. Then we're seeing larger skulls and brains compared to body sizes. So larger cranium sizes compared to the body, flatter faces compared to the cranium. And finally, we're starting to see a movement of the forearm and magnum. Now look how far back the forearm and magnum is in a dog's skull, right? So if I were to put a dog's skull on my, my spinal cord, I would look like this, right? Now, um, we know that primates have erect posture. That requires that the foramen magnum starts to move more towards the center of the skull. We see that among our Eocene primates. Just a couple examples for you here. Um, we have a group of primates called adipids from the Eocene that are believed to be ancestral to Struxerines. Um, this is just one fun example. This is Darwinius, otherwise known as Ida. This fossil was found um, in what's called a Messel pit in Germany, about 47 million, uh, and is about 47 million years old. Now I mentioned that there were gonna be some scenarios that are just excellent for preserving fossils, um, and a Messel pit is usually a great example of that because a Messel pit is kind of a, a pit off that's kind of on an area of a volcano that is hot and it tends to be quite sticky. And this particular mussel pit um, preserved it, just so many different organisms almost perfectly because what happens is they fall in and they kind of get stuck. 
and they ship down and they get continually stuck and encased in this like sticky stuff um, from the mesal pit that perfectly preserves them. So you can actually see hair preserved on um, Ida. And we have her stomach contents. So we know what Ida was eating, you know, unfortunately, right before it fell into this mesal pit. Um, but you can clearly see primate traits already. We have a nice long tail um, for um, uh, balance. We have a large cranium here compared to the size of the face. We have a clearly divergent opposable toe um, and five digits on the feet. Um, and generalized dentition, forward-facing eyes. So Ida Darwinius was absolutely a primate, um, likely one of uh, the groups of primates that would evolve eventually towards those kind of primitive-like strepsorine traits. So notice that strepsorines are starting to appear first, and that would make sense because they are the most primitive of the primates. And as we move from a rodent-like mammal to a primate, it's not going to be overnight. Right, the transition, uh, transitionary fossils, the transitionary species like Darwinius are going to have some of those primitive uh, traits, right? But some traits evolving more towards primates, and that's what we're seeing here among adipids. Omomiids are groups of primates that are believed to be ancestral to ultimately haplorines. Um, Tetonius is one that we believe may actually be ancestral to tarsiers, um, very similar to tarsiers. Notice not a tarsier yet, right? Transitioning in that direction. Um, so still doesn't have those gigantic eyes of the tarsier, but certainly large eyes for that period of time, small bodies, grasping hands, um, and that tarsier trait of a fused tibia and fibula that allowed Tetonius to leap as effectively as modern day tarsiers would. So not yet a tarsier, right? But gradually um, accumulating traits that ultimately may lead this uh, species line towards becoming a modern tarsier. Now the Oligocene period is going to be very important because this is where we start to see the split between new and old world primates or platyrenes and catarines. So um, something that you may notice about this period of time is that temperatures are starting to cool. And this is the first time, uh, it, at least in the period we're looking at, where you can start to see a little bit of ice forming at the poles. And what that's going to do is it's going to start to create seasonal weather but it's also going to start to create um, the, the distance, the, the level of heat from the poles. So it's going to be hottest at the equator and it's going to get cooler as you move away towards the poles. Now, this is only possible once the um, Australian continent is separated enough from the Antarctic continent because a, a, a cold current is eventually going to encircle the Antarctic continent, keeping it nice and cold then allowing the North Pole to stay cold as well. Um, the North Pole doesn't have any land, but it does have a pressurized system of air that's going to keep it nice and cold up there as well. That's then going to create the seasonal weather we're familiar with today. So that's only possible when the Australian continent has gradually shifted away, far enough away that an ocean current can then circle Antarctica. So during the Oligocene, we're starting to see, um, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna see a continuing cooling trend. Um, more deciduous trees are spreading, but cooling means drying and grasslands are starting to develop during the Oligocene as well. Now, remember that um, old world primates, one of the biggest distinctions between them are a lot of traits that evolve as a result of moving to the ground. So prior to this drying trend, it's likely that um, you know, strepsorine and platyrene-like traits, new world-like traits evolved for surviving in an arboreal environment. But as the climate begins to dry and some grasslands start to develop, suddenly there's a new territory, there's a new niche ecologically that nobody, that primates are not taking advantage of yet. So as some of them move to the ground, they're going to start evolving those old world catarine-like traits for surviving on the ground, like exchanging a big, long, muscular tail for a bigger sized body, sexual dimorphism, pads, callus pads on their rear ends so that they can sit effectively on the ground. Those traits are going to start appearing during the Oligocene as a result of these drying trends. So this is going to be the split 
between New World and Old World primates. The um, groups that may be ancestral to New World platyrene primates are called parapithecids. Um, and they have a 2133 dental formula. They have a postorbital closure, right? That plate behind the postorbital uh, bar, right? That bar is the circle. The plate is what is behind the bar in order to stabilize the eye. Strepsirenes do not have a postorbital plate. So this is the first group of primates that is starting to appear papillarine with that postorbital plate uh, behind the eye orbit. Parapithecids also have leaping hind legs, which might be a bit of a primitive trait for um, primates at the time, and of course reflects um, a good transition between. So a pitium is a good example of what we think one of these early parapithecids looked like, um, and they certainly start to have traits very similar to that of new worlds. Propleopithecids is the term for the group of primates um, evolving during the Oligocene that may eventually evolve into what we now know as old world monkeys. Um, Egyptopithecus is a good potential example of that. Um, some of the primitive traits that Egyptopithecus is still retaining are kind of short limbs, relatively slow moving, but a lot of um, old world monkey Catarine traits exist among Egyptopithecus, including um, the, a much larger brain, forward-facing eyes, sexual dimorphism, downward-facing nostrils, and a 2123 dental formula. So old world primates are absolutely evolving during the Oligocene. The Miocene is the last period that we have to cover here. And this is the age of the apes. It's also the age where humans appear. Um, somewhere between five and seven million years ago. We're going to continue with this drying trend. The continents are officially in the, mostly in the positions that we are familiar with today. Antarctica and the North Pole are fully frozen. Um, and so mountain ranges are still forming, particularly in Asia and Europe. Um, and all of that is causing kind of a general cooling and expansion of grasslands, drying expansion of grasslands. Um, and this is really going to facilitate a few things. Um, that is uh, the development of ape-like traits um, and the development of bipedalism. So Perconsul is an old world ape ancestor um, that is literally kind of right in the middle, right? Still has old world uh, primate-like traits, right? Monkey-like traits, but um, is moving in the direction of potentially being an ancestor to apes. This is a 23 million year old genus. Um, and note that they have monkey-like characteristics. They're quadrupedal, their arms and legs are similar length and they're walking predominantly with their feet flat on the ground. If this were an ape, the arms would already be significantly longer. But it does have a few ape-like traits, lack of a tail and more flexible hands and feet, which are associated with what will ultimately be kind of brachiation movements in the trees. I may ask you on an exam, by the way, um, monkey and ape-like traits of Perconsul. So make sure you note this particular uh, PowerPoint slide. Finally, um, an ancestor to humans uh, likely evolved during the Miocene as well. Um, this is a potential uh, ancestor to both humans and our most common um, recent ancestors, uh, gorillas and apes, uh, gorillas and, and chimpanzees and bonobos, um, Dryopithecus. Dryopithecus is a 12 million year old genus, um, still relatively small, but almost exclusive ape-like features, uh, capable of suspension or hanging right? Um, and walked like a chimp, but didn't have knuckles yet, right? If Dryopithecus had the pads for knuckle walking, then this would be uh, a species that's already along the line towards modern apes. But because it doesn't, it could potentially be, it also has longer arms, but not as long as modern apes, right? So if it had long arms like modern apes um, and knuckle walking uh, features on the, the um, uh, fists, then we would say that Dryopithecus is kind of already a little too far along um, evolving into modern living apes um, and could not be an ancestor of humans. But because Dryopithecus retains some generalized traits, we believe that Dryopithecus could have evolved, some individuals could have evolved towards modern apes while some started to evolve towards modern humans. Um, now, the large majority of Miocene apes um, were super derived to their environments and ultimately went extinct, but a few of them certainly evolved 
towards the modern living primates that we know of today, including ourselves. So I know I went through this fast. I know that this is a lot of information. The biggest takeaways you want from this lecture for your quizzes and exams um, and material is going to be the correlation between geological events happening in the era and epoch and how those may have um, laid the groundwork for certain primates evolving during that time. So you're gonna to wanna to look at those trends, right? Um, in terms of the weather and kind of what's evolving during those times and why certain traits would become adaptive like you know, traits that uh, uh, terrestrial old world primates will eventually evolve as they're moving into grasslands. Um, grasslands are going to be absolutely conducive to the evolution of bipedal humans as well, which is what's going to be in our next lecture. So um, I look forward to seeing you there. If you have questions about this material, please, as always, let me know. Um, general forum, office hours, if I'm hosting them during this semester and um, my email, and I'd be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Um, otherwise, I will see you um, for the evolution of humans.